a SAR is a active sensor because it has its own power source and it's using that to emanate or send out pulses of microwaves that then can be collected when they come back from the thing that they've reflected from back into space in, the, in our case anyway, or in this case. Welcome to the Mapscaping Podcast. My name is Daniel and this is a podcast for the geospatial community. My guest on the podcast today is Eric Jensen. Eric is the president of a company called ICEY, I-C-E-Y-E, and ICEY builds and operates its own commercial constellation of SAR satellites. So today on the podcast, we're going to be talking about SAR, Synthetic Aperture Radar. Just a quick message before we get started with this podcast episode. I, I realize most of you did not wake up this morning thinking, wow, I wish that I got more email. But just in case you did, I have an email list. If you go to mapscaping.com slash podcast, you can, you can join there. And this is simply a great way for us to communicate together. Increasingly, I'm finding that the algorithms on social media are sort of getting in the way of that communication. If you join, I promise not to overwhelm you. And it's just a simple way that, that we can talk together. If that's something that you're interested in, go to mapscaping.com slash podcast. And yeah, you'll hear from me soon. Hi, Eric. Welcome to the podcast. You are the president of Ice Eye, and today on the podcast, we're going to be talking about SAR. I think before we do that, would you mind just introducing yourself to the audience and perhaps giving us an idea of how you got involved in SAR? Happy to, and thanks for that. Delighted to be here. I'm a mechanical engineer by background. I spent the last decade working on everything from crew capsules for NASA to reusable space planes to satellites, and I was always quite curious about the why, and so I grew out of kind of my engineering roots and pushing for kind of new business models, envisioning about what the future might hold for different aerospace systems. And my remote sensing awakening happened several years ago when I realized how wonderful it is to build space things that have such an immense and direct impact on human advancement. I love the way you said building space things. I mean, w when you're a kid, right? That, that, that's the dream. I want to be an astronaut. I would like to build space things, go into space. And here you are, you're doing it. I, I think I would really like to start off the conversation by talking about or, or maybe defining what SAR is. Perhaps we could start there. What is SAR? Yeah, I love it. So SAR stands for Synthetic Aperture Radar. It was originally developed in secret during World War II, and it's used to detect objects using range finding techniques where we transmit pulses of microwaves and, and they bounce off something. And then we figure out what the time is between when we send the pulse and when we receive that pulse and we can calculate the distance to some object from where the pulse was sent. Let me give you an example. If you're standing at the, the top of a well and you yell down into the well, hello, then you count one, two, three seconds and you hear hello back to you. Okay. So now we know the time that it took for my, my voice to travel down the well, bounce off whatever's in the bottom of the well and come back to me at the top. And because I know that time and I know the speed of sound, Speed multiplied by time equals distance, so I can figure out how far, how deep the well in that case was. The same principle really applies to radar in any domain, but also from space. So back in World War II, the Royal Air Force was developing radar techniques and trying to figure out if they could look across the English Channel and sense, so to speak, when some adversarial thing was headed their direction. Could they send out a signal and have it bounce off a boat or an aircraft and then be reflected back to wherever that emanating source was on the British side and determine the distance between the British border and this thing that was coming towards us, whatever it is. So the idea was to kind of create like an advanced warning system that would you know, aid in preparedness for an oncoming attack. The interesting thing, a lot of SAR people will know the story of RAF Air Marshal Tedder, who lived from 1890 to 1967. When the Brits were first developing this system and they deployed it, it failed during their first test in front of the air marshal, who was, you know, the head person at the time. And his famous quote about SAR, or this radar anyway, was, the absolute ingenuity of this idea almost blinds one to its worthlessness. So, so SAR almost died on the vine a long time ago. So the cool thing, I mean, if we go to like first principles about anything that's visible or anything, any light waves, let's just leave it at that, all light even visible light and invisible light to our human eyes made up of electromagnetic waves, right? So waves can be described by both wavelength and frequency, right? The electromagnetic spectrum defines the type of light that is available out there in the universe based on frequency and wavelength characteristics. So 
visible light, the rainbow of light that we see is somewhere between the infrared and the ultraviolet portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, right? So when we see things that's usually light coming into our retinas with wavelengths on the order of hundreds of nanometers, so like, you know, a couple hundred to 700 nanometers would define the different colors of the light. Radar is the frequency and wavelength regime that's characterized by microwave, like the title microwave. So much larger wavelengths than visible light on the order of like centimeters. And so that's kind of just basics of like where to find radar and why it's different than optical, as we call it in the GIS community. So then the question becomes kind of, you know, what is SAR? Why is this title synthetic aperture anyway added to radar? Why can't we just use a radar? And so that really gets down to what wants to be done with this instrument. And a typical term we hear in, across the community is, is resolution, right? Resolution defines in our like layman's terms, the quality of the image or like how clear an image is. And so when you have a, when you have a radar instrument, the spatial resolution of radar data is directly related to the wavelength of the sensor and how long the sensor is. So I'll give you an example. Like if you have a, a single C-band radar, which operates around five centimeters in wavelength, in order to get a 10 meter resolution picture on ground, which means you've got to identify something on the ground that's 10 meters from something else, you would need an antenna that's like four kilometers long, which would be like very impractical to fly up into space. You could never deploy something that big. It would be like really unwieldy to launch it, and it would just be way too massive in order for it to be structurally sound. And so the moniker synthetic or synthetic aperture is used because what we can do is we can like create an effective sensor that operates like a very, very long antenna, but is in fact much smaller. And the way that it works is instead of sending like one pulse out from a, a, a antenna that's, that's super long, that pulse goes down to the ground and it reflects off a car. And those pulses then go back to this super long antenna. That antenna will catch pulses that are bouncing off the cars at very, very different angles. And so we can process that product and make an image of it if we have this super long antenna. Well, because it's not practical to fly those in space, what we need to do with the, with the space space antenna is send many, many pulses in rapid succession and then collect those reflected microwaves from various angles at the various times that they bounce off that object. So instead of like one big long antenna that sends one big pulse at one time and then collects the pulses that come back, we actually have a much smaller antenna that sends lots of pulses in quick succession over time as the satellite goes through space. And then it quote unquote listens to the pulses that come back to it when it moves through its orbit. And that's why we have the name synthetic applied to the radar. I don't know if you've ever considered teaching, but I think maybe you should. That was fantastic. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. I think I now know significantly more about SAR than, than I ever dreamed was possible. I think one of the really important things you mentioned there was that we are actively sending out a signal. So SAR is an active sensor as opposed to a passive sensor. And we see the same thing with, with LiDAR, for example. We're actively sending out a signal, and then you know, we're, we're catching that when it comes back. Could you give me an idea of what we can tell about a surface when we capture the reflectance? Are we measuring the roughness of the surface, the hardness? What is it that we're measuring with, with SAR? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'll, I'll emphasize the point you, you made, Daniel, on the difference between the active and passive sensor. You know, a SAR is an active sensor because it has its own power source, and it's using that to emanate or send out pulses of microwaves that then can be collected when they come back from the thing that they've reflected from back into space in, in our case anyway, or in this case. Whereas, you know, a camera, right, a typical camera focuses incoming light onto a detector array, which has millions of little pixels on a 2D grid. Well, that visible light that's coming into the camera, like a passive sensor, is coming into it because we have ambient light from the sun that's illuminating the earth. And we're just capturing what's visible in the direction that we're looking at one time. So obviously is, is very different because it sends its own signals. So we can talk about why that's super unique maybe a little bit later, but the question that you asked around, you know, what can you do with SAR, I think is a great one because you know, that's really the revolution that we're seeing in the ecosystem right now. SAR is great at measuring distance and that's pretty much it. <laughs> so I mentioned that because again, that's the first principle of SAR. SAR is a range finding tool. Now using different frequency bands in the microwave portion of the electromagnetic spectrum allows us, based on the differences in frequency and wavelength, to detect 
quote unquote, different things that we're, out, we're also measuring distance from. So whether we're using L band or S band or C band or X, which are all different frequencies and wavelengths, but all microwaves, our ability to determine things like the roughness or a surface property really all comes down to the distance characteristics that are being measured by each one of those bands. So generally speaking, for example, the higher the frequency, the higher the resolution potential for an image, but the worse the penetration power. Like so, so for example, KA band is a band that's used in communication systems. It's also a microwave. It's rarely used for SAR because while it might offer great resolution since it's very high frequency, it's easily absorbed by the water moisture in clouds. So if you had like a SAR sensor that operated in KA band from space, you could do very high resolution when clouds weren't present. But if you had like immense cloud cover, then you would, you know, your signals would be attenuated, so to speak, by the clouds and you wouldn't be able to get the signals back from where they're sent or they might even actually reach their target. So frequency bands that are lower in frequency and wavelength, like X band or L band or even UHF, they both offer the opportunity to still get good resolution pictures, but they have that nice balance because they do penetrate through things like clouds. And even like L band and UHF band, for example, can penetrate vegetation and they can tell us things then about biomass and whether or not there's moisture in soil, those type of things. So all of those insights, though, are still derived from the basic principle of SAR, which is what is the distance between where I am and where something else is? And we can do that with a building or we can do that with a water molecule inside or buried just underneath the surface of the earth. I mean, it's just a matter of how fine and sensitive your sensors are and what kind of bands you use. Wow. So SAR is really good at measuring the, the shape of the earth. W would that be a fair statement? SAR is excellent at measuring with millimeter precision, the surface of the earth from space. Yes. Because when those signals you know, you know with, with very good, very high level of certainty where you're sending the microwave signals from in space, and then you can calculate where you are relative to some point on Earth and determining the time that it takes the signals to come back to the spacecraft, you can very precisely measure the surface of the Earth. Yes. Okay, so I'm, I'm just trying to get a, an understanding here. With my limited understanding of, of remote sensing, like I know, for example, that we can use different sensors that produce, that will capture different radiation frequencies, I guess you could call them, create images. We can use those pixels, for example, to build up a signature and we can identify objects based on their pixel signature. It sounds like with SAR, what we'd be doing then is we're looking for the shape of the object and identifying it by its shape. Is that correct? Yeah, that's a good distinction. I'm assuming this means that we can also make some pretty accurate digital elevation models using this kind of technology. SAR naturally lends itself to creating digital elevation models. If you think about what's needed today to create an elevation model from electrical optical imagery, one would need to collect images from multiple different angles of the same type of target, hopefully around the same time of year, season, that kind of thing, and fuse all that together to create a product that would otherwise you know, maybe look like a 3D type product. Now, there's many companies out there that are doing that in an amazingly efficient ways and creating some incredible derived data sets and um, products from that. So not to belittle anything that's going on today because there's it's absolutely a, a necessity. But the, the cool thing about SAR is that because these systems can collect imagery day, night, and in any weather, they naturally lend themselves to what's called coherent type collections where you can have a spacecraft that is collecting an image over the exact same area of interest from the exact same point in space. So the same type of geometry of the imagery that's being formed over and over and over again. And that allows for something that's very unique to SAR, which is the ability to rapidly create interferograms or do interferometry, where with advanced tools, one could very rapidly determine what's the difference between the picture that I, I formed before and the one that I have before me now. And so modern systems that are flying in low Earth orbit are able to do this type of collection to create this interferometric product, you know, multiple times per day in the near future. And that is something that's never really been done before, ever from commercial systems in space on, on that type of frequency. And so again, thinking about like the applications of that, where you have distance elevation models that can not only be created rapidly, but then can be updated rapidly based on the change that's been detected on a daily or even an hourly basis. That is something that SAR 
is uniquely positioned to do because again, it can collect this imagery really at any time through any weather, whereas other systems have to wait for that perfect shot where you have no cloud cover and it might be weeks before that happens. And then when it does, you have to make sure that, again, the orbital parameters are such that the geometry of the collection was exactly the way that it was before. So in terms of you know machine to machine interfacing and, and where that might go, I think this entire field of study around interferometry is uh, going to be further, you know, more vibrant by the fact that there are this now proliferation of SAR systems that are providing kind of efficient commercialized data. Okay. And you said something else really interesting earlier on in the conversation. You talked about penetrating clouds. For me, this is, this is the true magic of SAR. Could you talk to us about that part of it just for a minute? So that really is what's, you know, what's so different about SAR or the images that are formed by synthetic aperture radar instruments versus images that are collected by passive optical, electro-optical sensors. Again, when you've got a passive sensor, you can only take a picture of what you see. Like, like what we see with our visible eye is, is a great analog, right? So if you're up in space, you're looking down, 60% of the Earth is constantly covered in clouds. And the places that we really cared looking about where people live are sometimes as high as 80%. Things like smoke or volcanic ash or those type of things hinder our ability to collect images over certain areas of interest. So the beauty of SAR is that because it's an active sensor, and as we mentioned before, given the choice of a certain band that's employed with a certain frequency and wavelength characteristic, SAR is able to penetrate clouds, meaning when you form an image, the microwaves go through the clouds, bounce off the things on Earth, and are then detected by the sensor with complete disregard to the clouds that they passed through. That is a very unique characteristic of SAR, and that's not the only thing. SAR can also collect imagery at night. You don't need any background illumination source for, a, for an active sensor. So you can imagine a system of SAR satellites could then form imagery day, night, and in any weather is kind of a typical thing that SAR zealots say. So I just want to sort of try and summarize a little bit. So we've got the we've got the capability to detect the shape of the Earth through the clouds and at nighttime. And you know, as we talked about before, this is an active sensor. And in a previous conversation, we were talking a little bit about the licensing around this kind of technology. And you were describing a situation to me where you couldn't have active sensors working in the same geographic area. Could could you walk me through that example again? Sure. It's just to say that at the limit, there's a saturation point. If you had 100 SAR sensors that were all pointed at the same thing, and they were pointed there from the same location, and they were all operating in the exact same frequency regime, so like let's say they were all using C-band, and they all had the exact same frequency and wavelength of the pulses they were sending out, you can imagine that the pulses that are coming back, there's not going to be an easy way to detect the difference between whose you know, sensor sent which C-band pulse at which time and whose was being collected at what time. So that's what we typically call interference uh, in the industry. It's a communications, like a satellite communications term. It happens all the time in satellite communication systems where you have, you're trying to create a link between two points and there's many, many different terminals on the ground that are looking back up at some spacecraft in geo, for example, trying to connect to it and get a signal. And sometimes if you have a high density of those terminals on the ground, you can't get that signal very easily. You get garbled pictures and bad quality and can't you know find the right channels that you want if you got a satellite communication dish now things have gotten much better over time but early instances of communication systems dealt with that type of problem and so the same really applies to to any you know microwave based sensor or rf type system that would you know where you have electrons that are being sent right on top of each other and those packets are then trying to be received by the same sensors if they're co-located it can be problematic and that's why there's organizations like the itu the fcc that help regulate and promote harmony in the ecosystem such that we deconflict or that we plan to, you know, not have those type of interferences. What are the kinds of things those organizations do or what do they put in the world for? Because it's one thing to make sure that we don't have those kind of conflicts in terms of disturbance in the signal. But what about like return times, orbits, the, the height of, of the satellite, that, those kinds of things? Is, is that all somehow baked into these organizations or is that something that these organizations are, are interested in? It is, yeah. It's all baked into kind of the basic operating charter of organizations like the FCC and ITU and others around the world that are similar to that. So it all comes down to operating licenses that are granted to companies that both build and fly communication systems and those that fly remote sensing systems. So essentially, you, you need a license from any given country 
to operate in certain frequency regimes, both the sensor and then the radio frequency to communicate between the ground and the spacecraft. Essentially what happens is these organizations have a giant database of which satellites are operating in rich frequency regimes and what are they doing and where are they flying, what altitude, what orbits, what inclination, all that kind of stuff. And then they can help deconflict when you submit your plans to them to obtain your license. They can help deconflict by saying, well, we know you want to do this, but this other company's already operating in this specific space. Either go talk to them or we'll help you kind of figure out a way to change your system such that it can operate without interference. I just want to stay with this just for a second because I found this this really fascinating when you were talking about it in a pre-interview. And I, I want to try and understand that this license to operate over a, a given geographic area, so over a country. So if we think about fishing, for example, we have you know an exclusive economic zone that surrounds each country. Is there something similar to that when I apply for a remote sensing license over a certain country? There is. There's kind of an international governing body that tries to help adjudicate between countries, but then each country has their own unique protocols and rules such that, you know, depending on the amount of systems and the you know, innovation and the vibrancy of the industry, so to speak, they may have more or less rules around, you know, who can operate, where they can downlink data to. There's basic things that we have to be very careful of. For example, if you have an airport, like a major hub that's an airport, let's say like London Heathrow, the way that British authority is going to handle licensing of satellites is going to be such that they ensure that people operating satellites that might be sending signals down over the UK are going to be doing so in a manner that does not interfere with what's going on at the airport. I mean, that's just a simple example. Like th Those are necessary things of societal interaction and greasing the wheels of economic efficiency that these organizations help us do by providing us with insights that we wouldn't otherwise know about, you know, what satellite systems are up there and which ones are planned. Thank you very much for walking us through that. If it's okay with you, I'd like to move on and talk about some use cases now. So th there is a, a Twitter account called the Sisters of SAR. It's, it's a brilliant Twitter account. I'm sure you can sort of guess what, what, what they're all about. And I asked them a question the other day and it was, and the question was, if you had access today to real time SAR data, what would you do? And, you know, everyone got really excited and it was an interesting thread to follow along. But people were like, I would monitor earthquakes and land erosion and coastal erosion and, and forest fires and you know, offshore pollution detection and ship detection and crop monitoring. Forest fires, for example, how do you monitor a forest fire using SAR data? The real challenge with fires, like with anything else, is responsiveness. You know, how quickly can you get assets up in the air, eyes, so to speak, on target and figure out what to do about this thing? Bringing this back to SAR for a second, the reason SAR has a role to play is because the SAR instruments that are used by companies operating space-based constellations today typically operate in frequency wavelength regimes that allow their instruments to form imagery through smoke and through clouds and through even through ash. And because of that, SAR can be a very useful tool in the sense that you can collect imagery over a fire and provide that to teams on the ground to know exactly what is the extent of this fire. So let's just pause there because now we have this thing that's happened. It's a major event. We've got all the normal sources of data. Now we're layering on top of that a data source that can see through the fire essentially and down to where it's being burned and it can determine the difference between foliage and trees that have been burned and the ones that haven't based on the way that they look in the, in the image that's formed. And I mean, this is a, a very analogous to how you're taking a picture with an optical sensor, but the SAR data is, is basically telling the difference in distance between the trees that have fallen down or burned versus the trees that are kind of standing up. And that's how you would notice where a, where a fire line is. Ah, of course. So we, we get back to the idea of looking at the shape of the world again. So seeing that the shape has changed, perhaps like, OK, there's a clear line between here. Have we, we've got trees with foliage. The shape is different on the other side of the line that the trees have no foliage. Maybe they are disappeared. Maybe we can see the surface clearer, something like that. But it, it comes back to looking at the shape, looking at the distance. Right. Exactly right. And then, then if you take that a step further, let's say we've collected one image over this given fire which was very helpful. Then the next image we collect will have an ability to see how the, the line of the fire, let's say, has progressed from one period of time to the next period of time. And so the shorter that we can make that window increase the temporal resolution, so how, how the frequency with which we were, were making those images over a given fire, the better we'll be able to 
address where it's gone and where it's going and in a predictive way, hopefully stop the fire much faster. So th this leads us perfectly on to the idea of persistent monitoring. But I, I just want to leave that just for a second because there's, there's one more use case I would like to sort of walk through, if you will. This is the use case of finding an oil spill. So I, I understand it now with the forest fires because a forest fire is destructive. It changes the shape of the surface of the world. We can detect that with SAR. It doesn't matter if clouds are in the way. It doesn't matter if it's nighttime. You know, th this is going to work. I, I kind of get that. But in terms of an oil spill, let's say an oil spill at sea, I am unclear how SAR can detect the boundaries of that, for example. Yeah, this gets into uh, some very interesting and complex mathematics around you know, why is it a, why are we able to see the difference between oil and water on the surface of the ocean? But suffice it to say, in layman's terms, because the density is different, the reflectivity, let's call it, of the liquid will also be slightly different, such that this, the time that it takes a signal to come back when it hits pure water versus when it hits oil may also be different. And in that case, you'd quote unquote see the difference between both substances on the surface of the water. And that's actually one thing that SAR is very good at doing is de detecting oil spills that are you know, residing on the surface. And the other, so I think as a use case, it's a perfect example of why SAR is so great because you can look at things day, night, in any weather and on the surface of the ocean, you can sense, so to speak, if there's an oil spill or if there's an oil leak and you can monitor that because it's not gonna be moving typically very fast unless it's coming obviously from a vessel and you have to figure out where that is. But uh, it's a great, a great use case for SAR. I want to go back to the idea of persistent monitoring ju just for a second here, because yeah, I mean, it sounds like a great use for SAR, right? Again, we can see through clouds. It doesn't matter if it's daytime, nighttime, it, you know, th this is going to work. Just before we were talking about this real time or near real time SAR data, what is that going to look like in terms of actual time? Are we talking within seconds of the image being taken, do we have that? Or does it have to pass, does the satellite physically have to pass over a downlink station and then it comes down to that station processed in some way, shape or form and sent off to the user? Is it, you know, is near real time, is it actually within hours of the image being taken or is it much sooner than that? With the systems that are flying today, it's minutes to hours in terms of the time between when an image is collected over a, a object of interest and when it's delivered in a usable format to someone. It depends on a lot of things. It depends partly on physics. So how many assets are actually flying and in what orbit? So can they actually collect over a certain place and with what frequency? And then it kind of, of course, after that, it's down to, you know, the electronic engineering between all the signals that are, are required, where the data is then passed from the satellite or either stored on board and then downlinked to some ground station. Then it goes through either the cloud or some other ground-based network to some facility where, or some cloud-based processing tool where it, your processor then does some complex mathematics and takes all those signals that are in raw format and converts them into something that looks like what you and I would call a picture and then be able to provide that, send that out to a customer, for example. So I, right now, the responsiveness of most systems is, is you know, minutes to hours, just depending on the use case, the circumstance, like what are the boundary conditions around you know, a given customer or a you know, given user. Yeah, I mean, I mean that, that makes perfect sense. If we sort of move on the conversation now and talk about the, the future a little bit, we've talked a lot about some monitoring use cases and how SAR is a, you know, a good tool for, for monitoring because it can see through clouds, it doesn't matter if it's night, yada, yada, yada. And obviously with real-time data, hopefully, or near real-time data just around the corner, you know, it, it's going to be a, this incredible tool. I'm wondering though, when we deliver someone real-time data, are we just delivering them a real-time problem to solve? Or can you imagine a world where you're, instead of delivering an image, you're delivering an, an answer? I think that's the world we live in today in terms of the demand. I think users of SAR data around the world, and indeed users of, of electro-optical data around the world, there's a lot of data sources, and that's a good thing. The question is, are, are there are a lot of answers to hard questions? Right now, we have excellent ability to provide near real-time insights and answers to certain questions, but there are other larger questions around environmental monitoring and, as we've discussed, natural catastrophes that are very difficult to answer. And so I think that there are many teams that are working on developing sets of tools that can really just reduce the latency between when an answer can be provided from when an image was taken, for example. I mean, if you think about how things have evolved 
in the past several years in terms of you know processing imagery in general. You know, it, it used to be that even in the '90s, you had you know kind of only PhDs doing complex mathematics and theoretical mathematics with complex numbers. In the case of SAR, anyway, taking those calculations, you know, several weeks to complete for even a single image. There's actually a lot of metadata that comes along with a a SAR raw SAR product, um, even after it's processed. And so it might take you know weeks to actually resolve something that's going on, or or hour, you know, or days anyway to resolve an image, depending on the techniques that are used. And I think now with the vibrancy of cloud-based storage and cloud-based processing, where we we able to distribute kind of across the world petabytes of storage data and rapid computational power. We're able to embed software tools now that automatically can convert raw data into something that's usable as an image very rapidly. I mean, on the order of, of again, minutes to it's like single digit hours. And then on top of that, we've got teams and sections kind of of the of the value chain that are creating tools that then, you know, plug into those data sources and might add a little bit of latency to the overall kind of process flow before an answer is provided, but are, are ingesting those kind of initial imagery products in rapid fashion and then adding them to databases and searching through them, doing pattern recognition and building tools to do analysis on top of that and spitting out something that looks nothing like an image, but is actually like a, a derived product that's, that tells us something we really want to know about you know our infrastructure or society. So I, I think that the pace of all of that has just accelerated a lot over the last several years. There's this concept out there called geospatial 2.0. And as I understand it anyway, it's the idea that you know the machines are communicating with the machine. So we get real-time data, we get real-time answers. This is not a critique of the industry at all in any way, shape or form. Often I, I wonder when I hear this idea of real-time data, it's like, well, how are we ever gonna deal with it unless there's you know, a machine on the other side taking that real-time data and doing something useful with it and then sending it off in, in some other product format to an analyst or to a human, someone to make a decision with. I guess I was just really interested to hear your, your thoughts on that and where we are now and where we're going. I think the future is one of, of many, many machine-to-machine interfaces across the whole kind of, as we call it, TC PED chain, task, collect, process, exploit, or determine what's going on and then deliver. I think right now there are lots of humans in the loop depending on the the type of sensor the company you know the the design of the system all those things and i think we are absolutely heading towards a future where it's going to be more and more kind of automated across the board and i think that will will be very helpful in addressing some of the big problems that we've discussed today you know particularly in natural catastrophes i mean if you have a if you have an early warning system that based on a live feed of electro optical and sar data and many other data sources and all that's being resolved through some system that then ends up all this background work ends up with a little light on someone's desk who has the other button that they can push to deploy a rapid response team to this flood i mean that's an invaluable insight that can be automated in the future and i think we're definitely headed that direction think about every time that you do one of those recaptchas on your phone or your computer when you sign into a website and asks you to help identify a walkway or a bicycle or traffic lights you're aiding a neural network that's trying to be built in, in developing an algorithm around recognition of that thing. And the things that you're being presented with are too hard for you know, typical machines to determine today. But because we've found out these amazing ways to democratize human in the loop training of algorithms through reCAPTCHA, you've now got tools that are being developed with hundreds of thousands of inputs that have some statistical significance to them when aggregated such that they can train a machine to recognize a streetlight or a bicycle or a walkway. That's something that's an amazing advance that's just been happening while we were sleeping. The same thing's happening in the GIS world. And so, I mean, it's already here in a lot of different ways, but I think that given the vibrancy of multiple data sources, including you know, the rise of SAR sensors, given some of the cost efficiencies and miniaturization of electronics and the proactivity of entrepreneurs, I think as an, a unique data source, we're going to start to see that be filtered in such that it is able to help with automated detection and resolution of, of challenges. SAR as a, as a particular data set is very unique and there, it's so rich with data that we've only really, I think, scratched the surface of what we can actually do kind of on the machine to machine automated side of it. And that's what I'm really looking forward to witnessing and being part of. 
I agree with a, a ton of what you said there. And I, I too, I'm completely fascinated by that recapture. When you think about what's actually happening, I, I think I heard a statistic once where something like so many thousands of books are being translated every day by people doing that, you know, and, you know, identifying a bicycle. This is a bus. You know, I, I think it's absolutely brilliant. Could there one day be a SAR version of this? That's a great question. I'm sure a very smart entrepreneur is going to figure out how to mesh the two together. But I mean, we already are kind of in a certain way, right? Recapture is actually using imagery, not necessarily aerial or, or, or uh, space-based all the time, but it is essentially like an extension of the remote sensing ecosystem in a, like a bite-sized capacity. This is exactly what I'm getting at, right? So if you could show me, have an image where you could see the shape of a boat or a building or something like that, you know, and just click the box, right? This is a boat, this is a boat, this is a boat, building. Right, open source algorithmic trainings. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, I, I know that ISI is, is building, you're building your own space platforms, are, are you not? We are. Do you see a trend towards single purpose platforms or do you see people going more towards the, the, the multi-sensor approach? I think it really depends on the mission. I, I think if there's a mission that would want to have super high resolution imagery, capturing sensors combined with communication payloads combined with something else, maybe detecting RF signals on a single satellite. I mean, I think it's just a matter of whether or not the market will bear that type of strategy. Uh, and that would then govern the set of design decisions that justify a satellite of a certain purpose size, you know, weight and power. Certainly, I think that the trend in general is towards smaller satellites with more focused missions that are built much more efficiently and are designed with much shorter orbital lives in mind. And I think part of that is we've kind of seen the asymptotic nature of technology, generally speaking. So the things that kind of happen here on Earth in terms of their technological refresh cycles are somewhat just a little bit lagged in terms of their application in space because the environment's much harsher. But in the future, we will see more analogs in space to the smartphone, as an example, where you have a platform that's got hardware and firmware, but can be completely updated automatically and where it can host apps that can do multiple things with sensors on that platform that can provide different either phenomenologies or collection capabilities or communication capabilities. I think all of that will end up becoming more and more miniaturized, much more efficient in the future. And, and I think just indicative of by the systems that are being built today, we're seeing very, very high, highly capable platforms that are much, much smaller. I mean, a tenth of the size and weight, if not a thousandth of the size and weight of the platforms that came before. And that shouldn't really surprise anyone, right? That's just kind of the way that technology goes. It's a, it's, everything's based on the power law. Yeah, that, that makes sense for me anyway. A couple more questions here before I let you go. A task-based approach or a real-time feed? What, what way are we heading in terms of satellite platforms in general, do you think? That's a great question. I think, so when I think about tasked, tasking-based approaches versus real-time feeds, one way to separate that might be like a proactive approach versus a reactive approach. So like a, a proactive approach would be, I kind of know the things that I want to look at. And so I'm going to task my system or schedule the tasking in advance so that I can go look at those things because I'm very interested in deforestation or I'm very interested in crop health monitoring. And I know where my soybeans are. They're not moving tomorrow and the cornfields are still where they are. And so let's go look at those as frequently as we can over time or over a given season. The, the real-time feeds in terms of like a reactive type approach where you might have an API that you know, someone could use to task a system in near real time to change the way that it's operating. Um, I think those are two approaches that are here, meaning we have the tools and technology to allow for both operational concepts to be employed. The task-based approach is the one that most people are familiar with, and it's one that's traditionally used because it's a little bit easier to implement. But I think that that ease has quickly been resolved by the fact that you know, modern coding techniques and the efficiency of software systems in general allows us to do real-time feeds and real-time dynamic tasking of systems. So the main thing is, again, just who needs it is the real question. And take advantage of a company that's investing in a near real-time feed that anybody can tap into. And then, you know, the question then becomes, how does that company effectively adjudicate between people who want to task in real-time? How do they prioritize the collections in, in their scheduling hunt ops? such that everyone's made happy by what they want to see and when. It's a problem that, or it's a challenge anyway, that remote sensing companies have really always dealt with, which is, you know, I have these priority users over here and these lesser priority users over here, and how do you make sure that they're all satisfied and they all understand kind of when they're going to get the data 
at what time. But I definitely think that in the future, we're going to see more and more back to the conversation around machine to machine interfaces where, you know, systems can be architected in such a way that they're open and flexible from a software perspective. And as tools are evolved in the future, they will be able to respond in a more automated fashion and in more real time. So it might not be that anybody can open source task a system to go collect imagery, but it certainly will will alleviate some of the roadblocks that we have today in the like manual chain of events of somebody sit, you know sending in an order form that being ingested by a team that team then scheduling the tasking themselves uplinking that to satellites you know at certain locations in their orbit performing that collection and then disseminating that as as rapidly as possible i think that will just in generally generally speaking be become more and more efficient as we go the last question before I let you go. So during the, the, the pre-interview, I remember you saying, no one knows that they can't live without SAR yet. When do you think we're going to figure out as an industry, as a geospatial industry, and of course all the other industries around you know, SAR that, that are going to make use of these products, when, when do you think we're going to figure out that we cannot live without it? 18 months from now. I'm, I'm being a little flippant. I think that uh, yeah, I think the SAR revolution in aerospace is absolutely here today. And I know I'm a little bit of a zealot, but... It's being perpetuated by multiple factors happening at once. There's a great TED talk by Bill Gross, who's, who, when asked, you know, kind of what are the five factors that you, as a renowned venture capitalist, have seen add up to success for different companies? He kind of talks about, you know, the team being very important, the timing of the ecosystem's receptivity to whatever's going on, the idea, of course, the business model, and then the funding being kind of the core elements. And, and he kind of goes through which ones of those are very important and, and the ones that are very important end up kind of coming down to the team and the timing. And we can you know, debate which one of those is more or less within our control. I would just subjectively say that the timing is one that's in less of our control. And so I think that why is now SARS time to shine? It's been a combination of a few things. One, SAR systems to date have been mainly exquisite class. And exquisite class meaning they've been developed and operated by companies and governments that have built very large systems that are highly, highly capable with a few things that have happened in the last you know, decade or so, miniaturization of electronics, reduction in cost of spacefaring materials, modern manufacturing efficiencies. We talked about software, you know, the advancements in coding languages that allow us to more efficiently control all the elements of a spacecraft and indeed update those things in repeatable fashion. You know, we're, we're updating spacecraft now from a software perspective like we update code for anything else, like a, a smartphone or an application. We're writing code in an agile way for spacecraft. That's that's something that's kind of been latent in the aerospace industry and happening now in, in a, a major way. We talked about processing, how, how much faster it is now to process data that comes off of these platforms. We're using the cloud to store it and to process it and deliver it in incredible speeds. We've got a global network of ground stations. So all these things, I think, are bringing SAR kind of out of the shadows and into the light. And I think the reason it's been in the shadows for so long is because it operates in the shadows. It's part of the amazing nature of SAR. But I also think it's because the data was so complex and the amount of computational horsepower required to figure out anything useful to do with it was such that you really needed a team of expertly trained PhD level analysts to figure out how it could be used. And I think now we're seeing that companies are making it much easier, more natural for us to kind of use the same quote unquote language of remote sensing to talk about SAR and what its benefits can be. And now we're seeing, you know, companies devise systems that are producing SAR imagery much more frequently and commercially. Uh, so, you know, that kind of shareable data that's kind of open and much easier to license and, and uh, promote the use of amongst different ecosystems and different environments and different kind of sectors and verticals of our remote sensing value chain. I think all that's happening now in real time in a major way. And it's really only happened in the last kind of five years that we've seen the rise of the commercialization of SAR from space. I really want to thank you for your time. You've been incredibly generous and patient as well. This is a complex subject and I am far from an expert. So I appreciate you sort of slowly but surely walking me through SAR, explaining the process, what it looks like today, how it works, some of the use cases, and of course, what the future might look like. Really enjoyed the conversation. Before I let you go, if there's a listener out there and they want to reach out to you or find out more about what it is that you do, where, where can they go to, to do that? Sure. You can find out more about ISI on our website, ISI.com, I-C-E-Y-E.com. It's a treasure trove of information about how SAR systems work, the type of data that's derived from them. Uh, there's materials on there about you know flood monitoring, detection, and responses that we've helped support 
There's product guides to learn more about the type of imagery, the file formats, how it could be used. And I'm really just in general trying to help educate the community around SAR writ large. So that's that's where I would direct uh, anyone who's more who's interested in learning more. Thanks again, Eric. Really appreciate your time. My pleasure. I really hope you enjoyed that episode with Eric Jensen from ISI. SAR has been such a hot topic in terms of Earth observation that, that I thought it would be really useful for a lot of people if we created this episode, if we did an episode about it and helped sort of demystify it a little bit for those of us that aren't used to working with it. So I hope that was helpful. Um, yeah, well, that's it for me. As always, you're more than welcome to reach out to me on social media. You can find me on uh, LinkedIn and Twitter, especially those are the places I'm most active. And like I mentioned at the start of the episode, if you go to mapscaping.com slash podcast, you can join the email list and once a week I'll, I'll send you an email. And you are, of course, more than welcome to write back to me. In fact, I would really appreciate it if you did that. that. That would be great. And that's it for another episode of the Mapscaping Podcast. My name is Daniel. It's been a pleasure being your host again this week. I'll be back again next week with a new episode and we'll talk then. Bye.